Welcome. We're just going to give it a minute for people to join in. So please get settled. Great to see so many people joining us here today. Well, I think we have a healthy um, group gathered, so I will get started. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's talk, Casta Paintings, Picturing Social Order in 18th Century Mexico. My name is Linnea West. I work in public programs at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. And right now at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we have a pair of Casta paintings on view in our reinstalled early American galleries. As we note in a land acknowledgement sign in front of those galleries, the museum recognizes Philadelphia as part of Lenape Hoking, the ancestral homelands of the Lenape peoples a history of broken treaties, forced migrations, and fraudulent agreements displaced many Lenape from this land. The museum and its staff strive to understand our place within the legacy of colonization and to act as allies to Lenape peoples and their vibrant communities today, including the federally recognized nations, the Delaware tribe, the Delaware nation, and the stockbridge Muncie community. We pay honor and respect to Lenape ancestors past and present by committing to build a more inclusive and equitable space for all. Our discussion today of Casta Paintings promises to be really rich, and I am excited to introduce our speaker. We are joined by Dr. Magali M. Carrera. Magali, welcome. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here and be with everybody. It's great to have you. So uh, I'll just share a little bit of a bio about our speaker. Magali Carrera is Chancellor Professor of Art History Emerita at the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Her research examines maps and their relationship to nation building discourses in 19th century Mexico. She's written widely on visual culture in 18th and 19th century Mexico. Books include Traveling from New Spain to Mexico, Mapping Practices of 19th Century Mexico, and most relevantly for our conversation today, Imagining Identity in New Spain, Race, Lineage, and the Colonial Body in Portraiture and Casta Paintings. And I'll share a link in the chat to that later in case any of you want to look it up and do some further reading. So today's talk promises to be fascinating. I am so glad Magali is here to share her research. And our gratitude also goes out to the National Endowment for the Humanities, whose support makes this program possible. I just have a few um, housekeeping notes and then we can get started. Um, we are saving time at the end for Q&A. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A box. There's a helpful upvote feature. So if you see a question that you like and you wanna hear it answered, you can give it a thumbs up and those questions will go to the top of the queue. And those are the ones we'll answer first when we get to Q&A. The chat is also open. I can see people are saying hello there. Uh, I encourage you to share where you're tuning in from. The program is closed captioned and you can click the CC button in your Zoom toolbar to turn those captions on or off. Finally, we are recording this program. We're gonna send a follow-up email tomorrow that includes the link to the recording as well as any other links we share in the chat. Um, so you can look back at anything we discussed today. So with all that said, uh, Magali, I, I pass it over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to um, Oops, I went back. OK, so um, thank you, Linnea, for a very nice uh, welcome. Uh, and I'm very, very uh, honored to be here and participate in this. I'm going to begin the discussion uh, by looking at two paintings from the museum's collection attributed to Jose de Alcibar uh, or his studio, uh, an artist who was active uh, between approximately 1751 and 1801 in Mexico City. 
He was also a founding member of Mexico's first art school. Most of his works are focused on religious themes and portraiture of elites. However, there are eight known Costa paintings attributed to Alcibar, uh, thought to be produced again between 1760 and 1770. The two panels that you see here display the basic content of Costa paintings. That is the depiction of a female and a male with their offspring, each labeled with a specific name or designation. Each wears distinct clothing and the group is placed in specific settings associated with their social identity. Now I will come back to these images um, towards the end of the presentation. So just so you're clear on what I'm gonna be covering today, I'm going to look at a case study of um, a Costa woman that was brought to the Inquisition. Um, I will then move to a little bit of background information, specifically terminologies, origin and history, and then uh, Costa nomenclature. And then uh, we'll spend some time looking at um, various Costa paintings. And I'm going to conclude with a discussion of transitions that occurred in 19th uh, century uh, as we move from uh, Costa to Raza. Um, okay, so we'll begin with the case, uh, a brief summary of the case of Maricia Josefa de Apelo. It is a warm summer morning in late 18th century Mexico. An evening rain has left a soft haze hanging over the cobblestone streets and the sweet smell of wood fire fills the nostrils as street vendors prepare fresh tortillas. The bells of the cathedral drone the beginning of another day in the capital of New Spain. Now, on this early morning, in this early morning, Maricia Josefa de Apelo, an olive-skinned woman of about 35 years of age, wearing a old but very clean silk dress and a, and a shawl with a strand of pearls around her neck, strides quickly down the street on her way to the Inquisition or tribunal or court. She has been summoned to explain the nature of her belief in heaven and the devil. Having appeared in the court previously, Mauricio wonders what new charges will be brought against her recalling that in the past, the prosecutor's questions confused her at times. She knows, however, that no matter how truthful she is, the inquisitor will call her tonta or stupid again and again. Lost in her thoughts, Mauricia accidentally bumps into a light-skinned Spaniard woman as she descends from a carriage with the help of her maid. Smoothing her embroidered velvet gown and adjusting her multi-strand pearl necklace, she hisses, back to your body, oh mestiza wretch. You may wear pearls and own a silk dress, but you are still a lowly casta who disgraces our land and our society. Mauricia stares coldly at the young woman, then pulls her shawl tightly around her head and shoulders and hurries on. Turning the last corner to the tribunal building, she stops. The walkway is obstructed by a stack of paintings leaning against the wall, waiting to be placed in a nearby carriage. Mauricia gazes at one canvas that depicts a well-dressed man playing a violin. A finely dressed woman holding a squirming child who reaches for the violin bow. There is an inscription above the group. Mauricia can distinguish the words. De castizo y española nace español. From a castizo man and a Spaniard woman is born a Spaniard child. Mauricia considers herself to be an española as her mother was a castiza and her father an español. Drawn to the woman who gazes back at her, she identifies her casta designation, yet does not recognize herself in the painting. Jolted from staring at the picture, Mauricia hurries to the entryway of the tribunal. Now, although this is a fictional story, the, it is based on historical facts found in Mexican archives as well as other documentation. The record confirms that Mauricia Josefa, 
lived in late colonial Mexico City and was summoned to the Inquisition court because of alleged disbelief in the holy faith. During the hearing, Mauricia claims to be an Española, and this was called into question again and again. Documents also indicate that the Spanish elite of Mexico City were known to have had great contempt for mixed blood ancestry. Lastly, appearing in the early 18th century paintings which portrayed the three groups who inhabited New Spain, Indians, Spaniards, and Black Africans, and their offspring. In the narration, these seemingly disparate fragments of late colonial life in New Spain intersect with two distinct notions of categorization of a person's identity, biological identification based on perceived physical characteristics such as skin color or hair texture and social identification based on perceptions of societal structure and definitions believed to delimit an individual to a particular social identity. In this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this presentation, I explore the functioning of the concepts of identity in 18th century Costa painting. The realism and details pictured in these images can persuade or even mislead the viewers to think they are seeing accurate and comprehensive illustrations of the diverse peoples, sometimes referenced as races, who composed colonial society of New Spain. In fact, Costa paintings do not illustrate race, as often claimed. Instead, these colonial images stereotype and locate individuals' identity at the intersection of certain perceptions, not facts, about physical and economic characterizations and social standing. So we're going to do a quick check next through some terminology. Obviously, New Spain is the colonial, uh, the name of colonial Mexico during the Spanish rule. I want to make clear the notion of casa is distinct from the notion of caste uh, associated with the culture of India. Caste references endogamous marriages or unions within a specific group required by custom or law. Casta references exogamous marriage or unions outside a specific group. Further, race is a very fluid concept that humans are divided into distinct groups based on inherited physical and behavioral differences. Race acquired its modern meaning in, in the field of physical anthropology through what is often called scientific racism, in the, which started in the 19th century. Genetic studies in the late 20th century refuted the existence of biogenetical distinct races. And scholars now argue that races are social constructs or cultural interventions reflecting specific attitudes and beliefs that were imposed on different, on, on different populations. Moving to origins. Picturing of the New World of the, or the Americas goes back to the 1500s when European artists attempted to visualize the peoples and landscape of the Americas. Here we see a print depicting a semi-nude female who is the allegorical figure of America. She wears an elaborate feather headdress and sits on a giant armadillo wearing a quiver filled with arrows and holding a bow as well as axe-like weapon. The figure is set in front of a landscape displaying nude people and various animals appearing as emblematic injury, excuse me, imagery of the supposed or presumed barbarous content of the new world. While not the first representation of the Americas, this print may have one of the most influential in subsequent imagery. From visual and written um, historical documentation, we understand that much of 18th century painting produced in New Spain 
focused on religious themes, while secular paintings depicted elite Spaniards as well as non-elite individuals. Pinturas de castas, or casta paintings, are part of the secular grouping, portraying men, women, and their offspring in a hierarchy according to their supposed blood lineage. Social identity in colonial Mexico was embedded in the notion that New Spain consisted of two distinct republics. República de los Indios, the Republic of Indians, and República de los Españoles, the Republic of Spaniards. These two republics, however, were populated by three distinct categories of people. Spaniards, indigenous people who would be called Indians or Indios, and Black Africans who were brought to New Spain to fulfill certain labor needs but did not fit into either Republica. The supposed mixing of blood produced a tertiary or intermediate people identified as castas, resulting in a complex society due to the expansion of intermarriages and unions among these three categories. Now, as early as the 1540s, the Spanish crown sought ways to bring castas into social and economic alignment with these two republics. A sociedad de castas, a casta society was established and approximately 14 to 22 distinct casta designations were classified according to the mixing of Spanish, Indian and Black African blood. In this slide, we see a sample of a, one of these, uh, of a chart illustrating this invented nomenclature that would involve, that would evolve to, to name these tertiary groups. For example, the child of a Spanish and, of Spanish and Indian parents would be identified as a mestizo. A mestizo and a Spaniard union would produce a castizo child. A castizo and a Spaniard resulted in a Spaniard child. The offspring of a Spaniard and a Black African was designated as mulatto. You can see, um, uh, continuing through this chart, that these various names uh, ch were, are quite distinctive, everything from wolf, lobo, and coyote, and barcino. And we'll talk a little bit more about these later as well. These classifications were never standardized across Costa paintings as multiple variations and varieties of these of the structuring and nomenclature were common. Ostensibly, this, this system also proscribed the physical and social mobility of costas. For example, certain costas were not allowed to live in Indian neighborhoods. Official government positions were denied to costas and sumptuary legislation did not allow certain costas to wear specific types of clothing or jewelry. Produced in New Spain from the early 18th century through the beginning of the 19th century, the paintings were presented in two formats. Single panels, which displayed vignettes depicting various costa groups on the canvas, while multiple panel series illustrated costa groups on separate canvases. Both formats included inscriptions annotating each group's costa classification. Early costa images displayed half figures in front of non-specific backgrounds. After the mid 18th century, images more consistently represented full length figures in explicit locales, such as domestic interiors or open landscape. And within these settings, material aspects of colonial life, such as clothing, foodstuffs, and vocational items, as well as activities, were also depicted. As some of these paintings have been located in Spain, it is thought that the viewers were meant to be Spaniards. Some scholars suggest that the paintings were produced as souvenirs for Spaniards returning to Spain. Additionally, there was wide dispersal of these images into public and private collections in Europe as well as the Americas. 
little is known about who commissioned these Costa cycles as there is very limited documentation on their production. We move now to a single panel. This single panel was painted by Ignacio Barrera, dated 1777, and illustrates how Costa nomenclature was visualized. The panel displays 16 vignettes. Viewers are presented with the peoples of New Spain, whose labels appear below the image, identifying their Costa designation. And as you'll see on the enlarged, um, I made a, I pulled out part of the column and so that you can see a little bit of an enlargement of the figures, uh, which makes them a little bit clearer to you uh, on the left of the panel. The imagery includes the characteristic dress of indigenous people, as well as elegant clothing of Spanish elites who are placed in distinct locales from the interior of the house to the wilderness. The physical markers of skin and hair color are sometimes inconsistent, even ambiguous, and vary from scene to scene. In the lower section, we see the distinctive landscape of the basin of Mexico, um, or Mexico City, displaying the city's architecture, and you'll see it in the bottom with these two little, these two buildings in the corners, as well as uh, the canal system. Floating over this scene is a decorative frame displaying images of Mecos, M-E-C-O-S, considered to be barbaric Indians who lived in the wilderness as hunters and gatherers. Now, very unusual for Costa paintings, the bottom of this panel displays a text that references the painter and the person who com commissioned the paintings. It states, these Castas of New Spain were painted upon the request of Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Rafael Aguilera y Orense by his great friend and art enthusiast, Don Ignacio Maria Barrera y Ordonez. Uh, he has a bachelor's degree. Who has a bachelor's degree? It, the, it ends telling us that this uh, was completed in Mexico City and the, it's dated 18 February, 1777. We now move to a, consider a 1774 series uh, by Andres de Islas, a mid 18th century artist who was known for his religious paintings and portraits, as well as Costa painting. Visual analysis of his Costa works elucidates the juxtapositioning of imagined people within specific boundaries. The images of this series narrates, again, the three specific mixings of Indian Spanish, Black African, and Spanish and Indian uh, as and Black African. Now, I will review 10 of these panels beginning with the first three panels in the series. Panel one, which you see on the left, depicts an Indian woman dressed in a fitted white and red dress with a lacy huipil. And a huipil is a kind of a tunic or a long shirt, which is part of indigenous dress. She's wearing pearl uh, jewelry and she strolls with an Espanol or Spaniard man wearing contemporary European style clothing. Holding her headscarf, she touches the shoulder of a child who looks somewhat distressed. He is identified as a mestizo and walks with his parents as they stroll in a park or countryside. Behind the woman is a portion of a building while the male points towards the landscape. In the next image, the fa a family dressed in simple European clothing is set in the interior of the house. The mestiza mother nurses her castizo baby. The Espanol father embraces his wife and child. Pictures of landscape hang on the wall behind the group and to the left, we glimpse a garden. In panel three, a very fashionably dressed castizo man attempts to play a violin. The bow is grasped by his Espanol son, who is also quite well-dressed. The boy is held by his elegantly dressed mother, an Espanola, 
The group is seated uh, on tapestry, upholstered chairs. There's a lovely rug uh, at their feet. And um, the curtain is pulled back, as the curtain on the left is pulled back to show a sliver of landscape. Now taken together, these three panels illustrate a taxonomy of the supposed purification of each offspring's Costa blood evolving from mestizo to castizo and then espanol. This purification is made explicit not only by the lightening of skin color, but also by shifting from the reference to traditional indigenous clothing to the, of the first panel to opulent European style clothing, as well as by the move from an outdoor setting to a well-appointed interior space. Hence, as the child of an India, the mestizo boy is located outside of the city, while the castizo child is placed in a simple interior of a house. Finally, in the last panel, the Espanol son is depicted in a parlor, the heart of elite Spanish housing where visitors are received and the comforts and pleasure of privileged colonial life are enjoyed. The next group portrays the mixing of Black African and Spanish blood. In stark contrast to the settings of the previous panels, the imagery of panel four dramatically switches to the bowels of the 18th century house, a kitchen. This location introduces the notion of domestic labor. A simply dressed Black African woman appears to physically accost an Espanol man with a kitchen uh, utensil of some sort. He fends off her attack while their distraught mulatta child pulls at her mother's skirts. This unruly exchange is diametrically opposed to the controlled formal behavior of Costas of the previous panels. Unlike the purification of mestizo and castizo by Spanish blood, the supposed miscegenation of Spanish and Black African blood is characterized by contrast with the boundaries established by behavior, clothing, and physical location in the previous panels. This is to say that this image is a commentary on the problematics of certain mixed unions. In the following panel, a mulatta woman, a Spaniel man, and a morisco son are placed in a tobacco or cigarette shop. Now morisco, you remember from the chart, uh, references having Moorish blood. Although European in style, their clothing is neat but not elegant. And the scene has shifted from a domestic to a semi-public commercial space. The setting confirms their social identity as tradespeople engaged in cigarette making. These costas are semi-skilled laborers, possibly um, shop owners. Their pursuit of their trade contrasts with the leisure activities displayed in panel three, as well as the fractious behavior depicted in panel four. In the next panel, the Espanol and a Marisca female are presented with their albino son, the marisca offers the child food, perhaps some kind of pastry. The child holds a toy in the other hand and looks to his father who is focused on his writing, a skill that demarcated an educated individual. Wearing European style clothing, the group is placed in a darkened room, perhaps a study. Now in the 18th century and prior to that, the cause of albinism was debated at the un, uh, as the understanding of genetic mutation was obviously not known, albino individuals were uh, often seen as anomalies. Some argued that albinos could only be born from darker parentage, referencing people of African descent. Others claimed that albinos proved that darker bodies could revert to whiter ones without having to mix with European blood. Now this second group of panels, we see attention given to the mixing of this black African blood and that the content moves from this 
very aggressive behavior to a very productive work scene to a study where a male a figure is focusing on his writing. Continuing to our next set, we will see uh, paintings that focus on unions between Indians and Black Africans. We move to the public domain at this time. Skipping to panel eight, a neatly dressed Black African female stands behind a table of her open air, air stall, open air stall displaying a prepared food. She is giving what appears to be a spoon to a child designated as a lobo or a wolf, likely equ equating this identity with wildness or wilderness. An Indian male is raggedly dressed and may be selling used clothing or possible textiles. You see some textiles um, over his left arm. The group is placed in front of what appears to be a bamboo fence, indicating that they are on the outskirts of a town or a city. Panel 11, a Kambujo child is depicted as the offspring of a Chino and Indian woman. Now a Chino, for your information, is a result of a Lobo and Black African Union. Kambujo it uh, may be translated as referencing curly hair or dark skin. This group is placed on a street in front of a building. The Indian female dressed in traditional clothing of a huipil and a skirt is serving tamales from the pot as the kambuhu child reaches toward the pot. The man is possibly a water carrier. He uses a tump line, which is a kind of strap placed around the head that's tied to a sack and the sack is used to carry water or various goods on his back. He holds a bowl and a half eaten tamale. Panel 12 depicts a kambuho cobbler with his, uh, on his working at his workbench with uh, wooden molds that serve as patterns to make shoes behind him. An Indian woman is preparing food on a griddle, while a child identified as tante en el aire, translated as hanging in the air, meaning in between or unidentified identity. She stands behind her mother pointing to food. The group in this, in the, in this group of panels, viewers are, are seeing working class participating in the diverse life of New Spain. We are seeing the evolution of generations of offspring, referencing designations of earlier panels. By the third or fourth generation, the naming structure became more contrived and fabricated as evident in the use of non-descriptive terms like Tante and El Aire. The last panel in this series um, shows a uh, barefooted and scantily dressed mecos. Indios, as I said before, considered to be barbaric. And they, they are placed in the wilderness um, as hunters and gatherers. Their semi-nudity in female and feathered headdress and bow and quiver harken back to the print of allegorical America. They are without any of the visual references of colonial life because their dress and locale mark that they are outside the boundaries of colonial life pictured in the previous panels. In the Isla's panels, each Costa painting is explicated by comparison or contrast to specific boundaries of social stereotyping within these panels. References to various sites, whether house or wilderness, locates the social context of the individuals. This is to say, that the viewer is walked through distinct spheres of late colonial life from the interiors of Spanish house to the city streets and landscapes to the untamed environment. Now we return to the Alcibar uh, panels. Here, a half length figures are shown in reference to the categorization of blood mixing taxonomy, which we've been looking at previously. In the left panel, an Indio and a Mestiza with their Coyote child is placed at a vegetable stand. 
On the right, the morisca, wearing a dress with a scarf around her shoulders, pours a liquid into a glass bowl. An Espanol drinks from a large cup or bowl while the albino child reaches up to him. Note behind the uh, um, Espanol shoulder uh, is a horse um, kind of looking in at this scene. Um, and this horse may reference it, the male figures, either occupation or possibly social rank. I also want to point out that the, um, both women wear a black dot on their temple near their eye. And here's a little bit of an expansion of one of the um, panels. This is a fashionable ornament worn by women in New Spain known as a chiqueador, a cut piece of velvet and sometimes tortoise shell. Uh, glued onto the face to simulate a mole, which was a uh, considered to be a marker of beauty. The picturing of the two groups is part of the colonial history of attempting to order diverse people in a hierarchy, as seen in the Barreda panel and Isla series. Alcibar's Casta imagery displays the categorization of individuals within an imagined taxonomy associated with physical traits uh, and uh, living and working in certain colonial locales, wearing specific clothing as well as typical activities. In summary, Costa paintings attempt to stabilize the uncertainty, the ambiguity, and the complexity of individuals' identities by locating the people in the confluences and intersections between and among physical, social, and economic identifications. The paintings endeavor to bring order to the deceptive and equivocal nature of human physical and social markers by constructing dubious identities that visually and conceptually imagine social order. Now, Costa paintings were no longer allowed to be produced after the early 19th century as Mexico gained its independence from Spain. However, categorization of peoples continued into the 19th century using new terminology and formats. For example, Antonio Garcia Cubas, a highly respected map make maker uh, uh, who lived and worked in Mexico City, produced numerous publications, including atlases. This image is titled Carta Ethnographica, or Ethnographic Map, and is from Garcia Cubas's Atlas Pintoresco y e Historico de Estados Unidos Mexicanos, so picturesque and historic atlas of the United States and Mexico. It was published in 1885, and it reflects how the concepts identification of people would transform into notions of what we think of as race associated with the growth of ethnographic and geographic studies. Now, in the center of the page, the map of uh, Mexico outlines and identifies geographic location of different indigenous groups using longitude and latitude, as well as colored markings to designate designate the location of specific groups. So you see these kind of outlined yellow shapes and um, pink and a little orange and there's a bit of green here and there as well. And those um, uh, mark these different indigenous groups. Now to the right of the graph, um, we see uh, this, we see that there's a comparison of population numbers of the different indigenous groups. And what you're looking at is there's a little graph floating in, what I think of as floating in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and, um, and it shows the different, not each of the different indigenous groups. The map is framed by 26 vignettes that picture the peoples who inhabited Mexico in the 19th century. In the vignettes, we view people in a variety of clothing types placed in diverse settings from elite in the ballroom, which you see in the upper left-hand corner. And again, I have enlarged one section of this image to bring out a little bit of clarity into the details. Um, and we go from this ballroom scene to indigenous groups in the countryside 
on the sides and bottom of the print. And again, you see those uh, sample in, left, in the left detail. These groupings seem to allude to Costa organization of people referencing, again, clothing and activities. The content map, however, reveals a new categorization using ethnographic and geographic tools, as I've said. If we, um, to the left of the map and floating in the Pacific Ocean, is a graph that charts the transformation of Costa identity to new nomenclature. And you see this, I pulled this out uh, in so you could have a clear detail. It marks the total population of Mexico, as well as the division of the population into distinct groups. Above this graph is a legend identifying three naming conventions uh, of razas, which is translated as races. They are raza blanca, or white race, which uses a blue-gray color, raza indígena, or uh, Indian race, uses a pink color, raza mezclada, or mixed race, uses a, this kind of mustard yellow color. And lastly, population total uses this gray-brown. Below the legend is a graph that differentiates these raza designations. The gray-brown column indicates that Mexico, uh, Mexico's total population at this time was about 1.5 million. In the next columns, the population is broken down to display the following. 43% raza mezclada, 37% raza indígena, and 20% raza blanca. Here, the inconsistency of Costa tex taxonomy is replaced with statistical numbers to identify and designate the peoples who are placed into these three razas or races. Now, interestingly, linguists have shown that the terminology associated with the Spanish word raza developed as a cultural and linguistic metaphor during the early medieval and early modern period and was associated with animal breeding. Later, it would shift. The use of raza was modified to establish conceptual mappings for designating human beings. One scholar writes that the term could have emphatically positive or emphatically negative meanings that evolved in ways that had enduring impact as they would be used to formulate theories of both racial superiority as well as racial inferiority. In conclusion, whether identified as casta or raza, the images we have examined demonstrate that, uh, that categories of people are fugitive. More broadly, this leaves us to consider how racial stereotypes and perspectives of the past embedded in complex and historical viewpoints continue to present day unfixed social constructs that still function in assessing the identity of self as well as others. Thank you. Thank you. That was fantastic. And, and you covered so much in your presentation. Um, I thank you for that. I know I have questions and I, I hope um, those of you joining us do as well. Uh, we already have one in the Q&A. Now is your moment to, to ask any burning questions. Uh, please do put them in the Q&A. As I mentioned earlier, the Q&A does have a helpful sort of upvote feature. So if you see a question you like and you wanna hear it answered, you can give it a, a thumbs up. Um, but to begin, I'll ask a, a question from Patricia Danson, who writes, um, these Costa paintings seem very accepting of racial mixing, in contrast to attitudes in North America, which opposed racial mixing. Is this greater tolerance of racial mixing typical of Spanish colonies? No. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, is that these were seen as studies to delimit people's access to resources. And we have to think about that. Um, so there's, there's all kinds of stories about where these were found. 
Some say that they were found in vestries of churches and that uh, when a baby was brought in to be baptized, they look at the color of the skin, look at the Costa paintings and decide what the baby was. I mean, they, you have stories like that. And they are stories, they're not facts again. Um, so there, there is very little tolerance for any mixing. What is difficult, I think, to try to get your head around on it sometimes when I think about these is that that first series allows, however, Indian mixings and Spaniard mixings to return to the purity of Espanol blood. And I think that is um, probably, it's the most, the highest tolerance that you're actually gonna get there. So, because for those of you um, who haven't studied Mexico, in Indian, Indians were thought to be, um, I don't want to use the word pure, but um, you know, but I will. I'll use a, a kind of pure group because they were not impacted um, by, uh, say, different um, religions. If you if you kind of want to think about it, um, while Africans and Black Africans in particular were not seen as having their own kind of um, you know place because they were just in partly because of their skin color, but also the religious kinds of um, tribal uh, kinds of things that went on as well. Because remember at this point, um, there's all kinds of travel into Africa and things are being brought out of Africa and brought into museums as well. So it's kind of a long answer, but it, they, you know, once they got past um, mixing, um, well, you, can, you, can saw, you saw how Spaniard and um, Black African blood really is really quite negatively portrayed. Thank you. And, and thank you for the reminder that the Casta system was a very, this elaborate imagined taxonomy had real social and legal privileges for those in society. Right. right. Yeah. Right. Um, we, had, we have several questions that have come in. Uh, Joyce Hoffman asks, did Mexico City have all of these types of castas? Um, Yes, and so did Puebla, the larger cities, Puebla, Oaxaca, for those of you who've traveled, um, had this kind of mixing, um, but the mixing was um, it, you know, what we're seeing here. Um, they, they also had a sense of who was also in the wilderness, as, you, as I mentioned too, but the cities, yes, definitely Mexico City. Um, you can even, you know, if, if you look back to the, um, the slide of the, uh, from Kubas in his map, they have the people with the big sombreros, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that, and it kind of continues on because you go to Mexico and you buy a, a sombrero, right? Right. So, so, yes, yes, I think that, I think I answered that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Bonnie Zedek asks, it seems that most of the children depicted in the Casta paintings were male. Is that correct? And if so, what's the significance of that? Well, male children are prized more than female children is one of, part of what you're looking at because a female would cost you money to get her married and all that sort of stuff in Mexico. And they had to come, that is, they had to come with a dowry and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think it's just as simple as that. You know, sons were uh, very special, particularly as you in the elite class, because that's, of course, it's inheritance. And then even in that kind of middle area, the sons would take over the cobbler's business or the cigarette making, making business as well, but not the daughter. Daughters would go into the convent or be married. <laughs> Thank you. Oh gosh, let's see. Um, we have several good uh, questions that are coming in. Um, just a quick one. Uh, an attendee asked, could you please repeat the approximate date this type of painting was discontinued? About what? It was, okay, so Mexico um, is kind of officially given independence in 1821. And mm -hmm. uh, celebrated the, the history of that um, in um, May, in whatever, when is that? January, February, <laughs> December. Um, anyway, what, but it really didn't become independent to 1824 because you've got to think about, okay, here you've been a colony 
And now they're saying, okay, you're independent now. So there's all these wars that go on for about four years to saying, is it going to be this person who will be El Presidente or this person? And how will we set up our government? Because they got they had no background in government to be in charge of government, right? Because of the people. So um, so basically, 18, I like to use the date, 1824, there were a, a number of, of, a lot of its legislation, but the, um, they felt that Costa paintings referred too much to co colonial life. And since they're now independent, they wanted all of those stopped. So they were absolutely stopped and not allowed to be painted anymore. By that time, an art, uh, art school had been established as well, uh, well established. And so they had now different painting and, but they, at the same time, they wanted to sort of monitor their population. So you get what? Statistics, yay. <laughs> I mean, I find that a fascinating shift, this idea that we're going to put a stop to this mode of artistic production, but as you point out, uh, replace it with other means of social control and regulation. Exactly. Monitoring is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we have a, a great question from Deidre Waters, who asks, how do we present these to a 21st century audience with our heightened awareness of TIA and cultural sensitivities? She had a visitor tell her these paintings were quote unquote creepy. <laughs> Creepy. I mean, we get a look at some lines in here. Um, well, I think you have to be able to describe them clearly to people what they're seeing, because you have to, and I've, I said before um, to you, Lunea, is that there's a difference between seeing and looking. Looking starts to give you information. So you've got to look carefully. Well, what are these people? Why are they outside? Why aren't they inside? What are they selling? And all that sort of stuff. I think that's that's a piece of it to understand seeing. But more importantly, um, I just think that you know, looking at and you do have to look at more sets than two. That's part of it, which can be done by you know just putting up some things. But um, but one of the things I think is important is that. That, that, that these raise the question of what is race. And race, no matter what you think it is, is really about how you've been brought up and therefore how those precepts and concepts and identities are all embedded in your head. So what you, when you see and you look, you look and you, these precepts come back into your head. So I think you have to make people aware of their own kinds of, um, how they're, how they're sort of, what should I, I want to do this nicely, but how, how they are actually kind of naming people in their heads in a way. What's creepy about them? So the question is, well, what's creepy about them? Well, I don't like their clothing. They look like they're dirty or something. Well, but these are the way these people are living just as in this country, there's lots of poverty as well. So I think that's pieces to do it. So try to draw it into your own experience as well. Because yeah, racist is just a very problematic um, kind of statement. Absolutely. Well, I think this sort of leads us into uh, another question that we have here. Um, Bertha Samina asks, could you um, sort of overview this transition from casta to rasa? You know, what, what factors or ideas helped lead to this transition? Well, when the Spanish were managing, if you like, what we call New Spain and a lot of other like California and all the, all the other spaces in South America, um, they did not allow foreigners into their lands, okay? Um, and so because they wanted to keep whatever wealth it was in their land, they didn't want their people, uh, you know, uh, learning about other parts of the world. Um, with the advent of independence, then foreigners were welcome because they brought, what did they bring? Well, they brought business and they brought this and they would want to do that and buy this land and build a haciendas and stuff like that. That kind of went badly, but, um, but anyway, they would want to do that. So, um, you know, just to get back then, I, I really think that it was, um, the Vrasa business was probably brought over and I, I haven't been able to track this yet, but I'm on it. Uh, 
but at some point that whole notion, because it is a Spanish word, got put into um, the 19th century. That's all I can really clarify right now that it started to appear in Mexico in the 19th century. My guess is that there are more visitors. Oh, well. Thank you. Um, on a kind of different tack, Stephen King asks, the paintings show no evidence of enslavement among the Africans. Why is that? No evidence of what? I didn't hear that. Enslavement. Um, at, yeah, at this in in this particular set, you don't you know, don't see it, and and there was enslavement, but it was more that they were in you know stuck in um, not stuck, but they were um, servants kinds of things and people working in the field, and um, it, but but they are because the Spaniards are so interested in keeping African blood out of the and unions away from indigenous people, you don't see a lot about the slavery part. And that the slaves really had to do with the elite who needed them for farm work and the elite that needed them to manage their huge houses and that sort of thing. It really wasn't you know, some, of, some of the enslavement that we think of when I think about it. So it's a little, no. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, you, I, I reckon we only have a, a few minutes left, but I, we have so many great questions. I'll ask just one That's or two okay. more. I'm good. Um, we have a question asking, does the ethnographic map depict castas or language groups? Does it, what, what, what is included in that final language map groups. you showed? Language Not groups. It's language groups. Um, mm -hmm. and if I, I could expand it, I would, but it's really like the, uh, the different groups, because there were about, 14, I think, listed on that as well. So these are the larger groups. So they're just the Mayans and the different kinds of groups that live in Mexico. Otomi, uh, there's, there's quite a number there as well. And they still maintain their own identity for the most part in Mexico because mm -hmm. they still you know, have their, their spaces, unlike the United States where we took away indigenous space, they let them keep it for the most part, I will say that. Mm -hmm. And at the time of, of that ethnographic map, um, the new government of Mexico had done away, was doing away with the caste system as part of the colonial order. So they yeah. wouldn't have shown the castes. Yeah, by 1885, yeah. people would go, what are those? But I would say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, they're pretty, pretty much gone. And Mexico's trying to expand its economic economy at that point. Yeah. Well, maybe um, as a final, question on a kind of different tack. Uh, Edith Taylor asked about the artists who painted these. Do we know if the artists who painted Casta paintings were European or local artists? And is there a difference in these depictions of identity depending on the background of the artist? Um, that's a great question, yes. So the early paintings, let's say um, at the beginning of the 18th century were basically kind of local painters that may have had a tiny bit of training in Europe because they went to visit Europe because they could afford to do that. So there's some elite. So the early paintings are them. But what happened is uh, when the art school was established uh, in the 1850s, I believe. Um, yeah, would have been 1850s. Yeah, that's that's about right. Um, they uh, the 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 Spanish, um, you know, the the now Mexican groups brought artists over from France and England to train artists. So the whole thing changes and now you have much different kind of art as well uh, than that. So it, it was brought over uh, because they had these um, artists that would, some of them actually stayed and painted uh, and sculpted and did architecture as well. Um, but many of them just came over to train and then would go back to France or Europe or wherever they came from. Thank you. The question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think you did. Um, and it is um, one o'clock. Um, so I want to thank you so much, Magli, for, for sharing this history and context with us. Um, as, as one of the questions 
pointed out, I think today it's so important to look back at these paintings, not just for the history, but um, because they do help us interrogate ideas of race and class today. Um, so thank you very much. You're welcome. It's been fun. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great almost weekend. <laughs> almost weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all for, for joining us. Thank you for all your questions. Um, we're grateful to share this virtual space with you. We hope you'll come visit these paintings in the museum um, in the near future. Mm -hmm. um, we're, of course, grateful to the National Endowment for the Humanities for supporting Absolutely. this program. Yeah, yep, yep. And um, a final note, I'll say when you close out of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser. And if you have any feedback for us, it helps us to make better programs. Thank you. I just, it's been a great honor. I, um, this is very, I will say it's a very broad look. Uh, but there's lots of books that you can read and um, about them give you a little bit more detail and different perspectives as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everybody, for your great questions and your uh, as well. <laughs>